talk on Real Food, Real Farming by Dr. Banana Shiva. It's so nice to see so many of you here. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, my name is Ami, and I'm a member of the organizing team of the International Youth Initiative Program. Um, for those of you who don't know, YIP uh, is an anthroposophically inspired uh, training on societal entrepreneurship, which is based on this campus. Um, and at YIP, uh, we work out of the understanding that the world is one interconnected living organism in which everything has an impact. And so we also work a lot with the question around the relationship between freedom and responsibility and how we can be in service to the collective while also maintaining our individual uh, sovereignty. Dr. Shiva also speaks a lot on this theme of connection and our relationship to food, to farming, to uh, the animals and to humans. Um, and so it's been a great honor to have the privilege of learning with uh, Dr. Shiva the last few days um, on the course that we had at YIP titled Biodiversity, Food Sovereignty and Regeneration. Um, and we're so incredibly grateful that she also said yes to doing a public talk tonight so that she could share her wisdom uh, with the wider community here. On a more uh, practical note, um, this event will go until 8.30. Uh, Dr. Shiva will speak for the first hour, and then we'll have 30 minutes for uh, questions. Um, so there won't be any break in between. Um, before I introduce Dr. Shiva, I also wanted to say a big thank you to the Kulturku set for allowing us to use this beautiful stage. Um, to Martin and Peter and the staff of the Kulturku set uh, for helping us with the tech and organizing this space. Um, I also wanted to say thank you to the Green Party for supporting us and making this event possible. Thank you. Yes. So now I have the great honor of introducing Dr. Banana Shiva. Um, Dr. Banana Shiva is the daughter of a forest conservationist. She's a mother, a physicist, a world-renowned uh, activist, speaking up against the big corporations, speaking up against the extractive and chemical industries, advocating for the sovereignty of seeds, of food, fighting for the rights of farmers and for women. She's a leading figure in the movement for eco-feminism. Uh, she's also a writer and has written numerous papers and books. Uh, she's a speaker, an educator. Um, and she's also the founder of Navdanya, which is a movement uh, promoting and protecting the biological and cultural diversity. Um, she's received numerous awards uh, recognizing her work, and one of which is the Right Livelihood Award, which is considered the alternative Nobel Prize. Um, and for me, personally, listening to uh, her speak the last few days, I've been moved by um, your sincere and passionate love of life um, and in this time when there's so much confusion and so much corruption in the world um, the piercing clarity and compassion through which you are yeah, working to um, protect the freedom and the liberation of all life uh, is truly inspiring for me and I'm sure for all of us who are here and so yeah I'm just so incredibly grateful that you're here with us tonight. Um, please join me in welcoming Dr. Shiva. Thank you, Anna. Good Did the thank you come? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you to all of you. Wonderful to see you. For which for me, uh, time it's, for me is rather late because India time is four and a half hours ahead. Uh, so when they asked me to, for a title for the public talk, I said, real food, real farming. Because so much of the aggression in our times, every newspaper, every TV show, is talking about saving the world with fake food. You know, just like half a century ago, they brought fake fertilizers, synthetic fertilizers, and said we won't be able to feed the world without fake fertilizers. And they were synthesized 
nitrogen by fixing atmospheric nitrogen through burning fossil fuels. Then they said, we won't save the world with, without having GMOs. <coughs> and now they're saying, we won't save the world without you eating fake food. Now, A, if there wasn't a history of the consequences of fake narratives, on the one hand, and on the other hand, so much thinking in science, in practice, of what food is. This exercise of fakeness, of saying the, the, those people who are financing this, because you know, no one shifts to fake food on their own. No one shifts to GMOs on their own. These are always forced. So fake food will have to be forced. And, and, and the worldview that's being created is farming without farmers, food without farms. Of course, farming is what farmers do. And till recently, half of humanity anyway, I think more than half of humanity even today does agriculture, especially if you go to the south. In India, they've been trying to force the farmers off the land ever since globalization, the Green Revolution. And yet 60% of Indians still are rural and live on the land, are farmers, are dependent on the land. So this farming without farmers and food without farms basically is food from labs. But food from labs doesn't count of, come out of thin air. It still needs feedstock. And from the experience we have had, each escalation of the artificial is an escalation of external inputs. You use more resources, you use more energy to produce worse outputs. So, you know, India has had deep thinking. I mean, in the biz when I was busy doing quantum theory, I wasn't reading all this amazing stuff. But when the food question became urgent to me after 1984, when the Green Revolution in Punjab had led to so much destruction that the farmers rose in revolt. 15,000 people were killed in the what happened after that. And then the Golden Temple had to be invaded, which is a sacred shrine of the Sikhs. And that same year, a pesticide plant of Union Carbide leaked in the city of Bhopal, killed thousands. The gas just went through in the middle of the night, winter night, killing, th and people are still dying. And 10 of my sisters, have gone on a hunger strike to say, when will you give justice to Bhopal? It's the women who've been, this is 1984, we are in, in 20, 2023. Next year will be 40 years. So these two things shook me up and I wanted to understand, so I studied the Green Revolution. And then I started to follow ecological farming in which there's so many schools with, in, I think the deepest thinking is in the biodynamic. The most organized practices are in the organic because it, you know, it's, it's got e-form, it's got standards, it's got certification. It had Albert Howard. Albert Howard was sent to India by the British in 1905 to improve Indian agriculture because that's what the colonizers had to do to cook, always improve us. And he arrived, but he was a good scientist. And he could see with his eyes, these soils are so fertile. I cannot teach the peasants how to improve their practices. And he found the fields were full of insects, but there was no pest damage. So he said, I'm going to make the pest and the peasant my professor to learn good farming. As a result of which he wrote the book, The Agricultural Testament, which is what basically guides the organic movement. But we've been eating. Every, every being eats. You know, to be alive means to eat. And when I started to investigate deeper more recently, I, we, I did a whole book on food and health and its links. I went back to, to writings of people who were looking much more at at the spiritual values of food, at the ecological values of food. And I just want to open 
by sharing with some quotes. So I've come to the conclusion that the web of life is a food web. That food is a flow, it's a currency. Food is not stuff, food is not a thing. Food is definitely not junk and food is not a commodity. So the web of life is a food web and the cycle of life is a food cycle called the nutrition cycle. Everyone knows the nutrition cycle is vital. It's a food cycle. And this is regenerative agriculture. So in one of our Upanishads it says, Anna is food, A-N-N-A -N -N -A is a word for food in Hindi and Sanskrit. It says, for it is of Anna that indeed all beings are born. And it is from Anna that they obtain the necessary sustenance for living. And having lived, it is into Anna they merge at the end. And that's the soil. Yeah? And the best is, everything is food. Every being is made of food. Every being is someone else's food. Inst immediately, we realize we are part of the web of life. We are members of an earth family. And this, you know, three, four hundred years of craziness, of thinking we are top of the pyramid. Other beings are below us. They're just objects to be manipulated, objects to be exterminated and pushed to extinction. That thinking is actually not that old. That mechanical thinking began with Mr. Descartes and Mr. Bacon. And they were given the job of creating sciences of conquest. Bacon was the chancellor of England. And in the time when he was the chancellor, he was also in charge of the Inquisition, the witch hunts. So he took that whole interrogating the witches into a scientific method and said it's torture of nature that allows us to know her secrets. You've got to subjugate nature, you've got to make her your slave. And so we have a very violent way of thinking in a mechanistic way, and a reductionist way. Of course, the irony, you know, uh, I, I think often how, you know, this level of arrogance then finds its answers. So Mr. Bacon died by stuffing snow into a chicken to see if he could preserve the chicken by filling it with snow. Mr. Bacon got influenza and he died, the chicken didn't. <laughs> so not a very, you know, it's, it's very brutal um, experimental method, you know, a brute empiricism. And the gentle empiricism that Goethe talked about and other scientists who really see the whole and see all the relationships. And I love this one. So do not look, since food sustains life, it says, do not look down upon Anna. This, that is the inviolable discipline of the one who knows prana, you know, the breath and life. And And it, I think it's the Tetri Upanishad in the Mahabharat. They say that the highest dharma, dharma is the right action. And the highest dharma is the growing and giving of good food. And that's why India had this amazing tradition. You come to someone's house, they feed you because they're dharma. For the farmer, the dharma was not doing an agriculture of carelessness. I've worked with all kinds of communities in India and I remember a particular time I was helping an indigenous community who was fighting a bauxite mine on their sacred mountain, Yamagiri. So I'd gone there to support them and I was having meetings with them and at a certain point, one of the members just got up and mumbled something, and left. And you know, you, your, your typical understanding is, oh, something must have happened, it must be an emergency. What he was mumbling and his colleagues told me, so he was saying, now I must go beautify the earth. Farming is beautifying the earth. Farming in a good way, in a non-violent way. 
So the going, growing of giving of food is the highest dharma. Not growing food or growing food badly or giving people bad food is the highest adharma, the opposite. So we've of course messed up with the food system. First it began with making fake fertilizers because soil fertility is the living process of a living soil. Soil is living and the life in the soil creates the soil fertility. You know, this planet was a dead planet. But we are a living planet because first the microbes, then the plants, through photosynthesis, could take the sunlight and transform it and absorb the carbon dioxide. We were a carbon dioxide rich planet and depleted in oxygen. 98% CO2. And, and just this photosynthesis process of the green leaf and microbes took the sunlight, took the CO2, turned it into carbohydrates that many are now calling the molecule of life. And at the same time, give us breath, give us oxygen. No mechanical system can do all this, none. But those carbohydrates that the plant produces are then food for the microbes that turn minerals into soil. From the minerals, they bring the nutrients to the plant, they get the energy from the carbohydrates, and then the plant's organic matter is recycled. And before you know it, you're creating soil as a living system by co-creating with living systems. And this then created the conditions where our species could arrive. The oxygen increased, the carbon dioxide decreased, the temperatures which used to be, oh, how much was it? The temperatures came down to 13 degrees from hundreds of degrees, came down to a livable temperature for the human species to evolve. But this is also where we should be looking at how, you know, the whole, what's the Gaia hypothesis? The Gaia hypothesis is the earth is living, her living biosphere creates the atmosphere and regulates the atmosphere. And that's the reason temperatures came down, carbon dioxide came down. But what are we doing today? Industrial agriculture is a destruction of the biosphere and biodiversity and the illusion that somehow fossil fuels will replace it. Because all synthetic fertilizers, you know, they're fossil fuel based, the nitrogen fertilizers. One kilogram of fertilizer uses two liters of diesel and then it emits nitrous oxide. 90% is wasted, goes into the waters. And the soil organisms cannot live with the salt. So you have desertification. And these externalities, of course, weren't seen. You know, when I did the book on the Green Revolution, on the one hand, a lot of people, you know, started to see these connections. And on the other hand, those who had pushed the Green Revolution started to panic because the narrative was, we feed the world with chemicals. And here in Punjab, the chemicals were ruining the land, killing the water. And, and our, our work has shown that, you know, the synthetic fertilizer use then weakens the plant. You use 10 times more water, the plant is just water, absolute feast for pests, you get more pest attacks, so you use more pesticides. Fertilizer use leads to pesticide use. And there's a cancer train that leaves Punjab called the cancer tree. Its name is the cancer tree because of the heavy pesticide use. And yet we're still being told, you know, that they keep organizing in a new way. And right now the way the pesticide industry has organized itself is called the crop life. It has nothing to do with crops and has nothing to do with life. It's basically companies that produce toxic chemicals 
to kill insects, to kill plants, and human beings. Bhopal was human beings being killed by pesticides. 200,000 farmers die every year because of pesticide poisoning. So this is not a science of life. And they, you know, they, re, um, uh, they re engineered their name from the agrochemical industry to the life sciences industry when they were starting to use GMOs or wanting to use GMOs. And that's the second attempt of creating, of, of basically find way to manipulate and substitute nature and substitute good farming by creating an unnecessary input. If synthetic fertilizers were the first unnecessary input, manipulating seeds and plants to make GMOs in order to take patents was the second. And you know, when, when people ask me, why are you against GMOs? I said, I'm not against GMOs, but I'm against blindly accepting something that has totally failed. As a scientist, a failed tool cannot constantly be retooled as a miracle. Mr. Gates has recently said, the GMOs are miracle seeds, magic seeds that are feeding the world. But the two dominant, you know, when this whole debate started in the 90s, and I, you know, I would debate the World Bank, I would debate the industry, and they would say, yeah, yeah, the Green Revolution, things went wrong, but now we have the perfect technology. We're going to grow food on the moon in the Sahara and on toxic dumps. What did we get now, 30 years later? All we have is Bt toxin crops and herbicide resistant Roundup Ready crops. That's it, two traits. In four crops, corn, canola, soya, cotton. I know what the Bt cotton did to my country because I was forced to go into cotton, save, saving seeds, training organic farmers, um, helping create economies of weaving and using that organic cotton. Since globalization, we've lost 400,000 farmers to suicide because of debt. Of these, because this is the government data and the government puts out in this district, in this state, this many, we know that the districts and states where the cotton is grown. Because the cotton doesn't grow everywhere. 85% of the 400,000 are in the cotton area. And our competition commission recognized about three years ago, I think before Bayer took over Monsanto, they had recognized that Monsanto had a monopoly on cotton. 95, according to the government data, 95% cotton seed in India, and I guess the world, is GMO BT cotton. Now, if you use, if you produce a BT toxin plant to control pests, the success of that technology is the pests get controlled. The failure of that technology is you have more pests and the pest you were trying to control is now resistant, so you've created a super pest. A pest control technology that creates super pests is not effective. In the US, it was mainly Roundup Ready crops to spray more glyphosate, to kill all plants, you know, as the Monsanto. I, I remember during the negotiations of Convention on Biological Diversity, a Monsanto representative got up and said, we have such a smart technology that we can prevent the weeds from stealing the sunshine. And, and for them then killing all biodiversity, except the four plants that they were using uh, was basically a contribution. I think this is a very clear example of creating a, a product to kill life on earth, the green leaf that is the basis of the whole cycle of food. Today, half the farmlands of the United States are overtaken by super weeds created by Roundup Ready crops. Because what was ignored was that plants are intelligent, bacteria are intelligent, and when an insect are intelligent, and this constant pressure leads intelligent organisms to evolve resistance. So you have super resistant weeds and you have super resistant pests and more toxics are being sprayed and that's why they're rushing for gene editing. 
which the European Court of Justice has recognized as, as a GMO, because a GMO is a genetically modified organism where modification is done at the genetic level. Whether you add a new gene or you edit a gene, the results in both are genetic modification. And because all living systems, including the seed and the plant, are systems which are self-organized complexity, autopoiesis, as Machurana and Varela have said. And self-organization means an amazing harmony at every level of the genome. Every element of the genome is linked to other elements of the genome. One gene, one trait is not true. All genes work together to produce one trait. And each gene contributes to multiple traits, just about, because it's not a linear one-to-one -one relationship. And, and they're now calling gene editing as precision breeding. There's nothing about breeding there. And it's definitely not precision. Because when you're dealing with complexity, you don't look for precision. You look for balance. You look for nonviolence. And already in the first year, and, and another interesting thing is, when molecular biology was created, the Rockefellers were funding the whole gene reductionism. You know, we want to find genes under the skin because they had been, you know, eugenics had been criticized for sexism, for racism. So they said, okay, we'll put all this atoms of determinism, they called it, under the skin. And they funded molecular biology to reduce complexity of life to the molecules of determination. And that's why the ideology of genetic determinism is the gene is a master molecule. There's no master in life. Everything is a network. And, and all through those years, every Nobel Prize was given to people Rockefeller had funded. More recently, what happened? Oh, something. Is that better? Is it working? Yeah? So Mr. Gates funded gene editing, the CRISPR-Cas9 technology. And it's interesting, you know, CRISPR is, re that technology of absorbing a virus is the way bacteria deal with viruses. So they just see, saw how nature works and then appropriated as, as they mentioned. And he funded the California scientists and the uh, scientists in Cambridge. Then they started to fight. So he funded both to fight the patent. And he has a company called Editas that holds gene editing patents. But he got the Berkeley scientists the Nobel Prize. And this at a time when other scientists were finding out that it's such an imprecise and disrupting technology. Just give you one or two examples. You know, it talks about precision, but a, a, a study found that 1,500 single nucleotide mutations took place and 100 larger deletions and insertions when one gene was edited, one gene. 1,500 unpredictable impacts. An increasing body of knowledge is showing there is total unpredictability in the outcome. I remember very clearly, they were trying to, you know, in India we love the horns of cow and biodynamic agriculture is so based on the cow horns. And, um, and we have festivals, you know, I think 9th, 13th, on the 14th we have the festival of the animals, Matu Pongal. And they decorate the horns of the cows, and the cows are left free. You can't, you can't rope them in. They won't work. They're on a holiday, and they go around with these beautiful, decor, deco and you know, all, they're all over the place. These beautifully decorated animals, and and when you take animals and put them in a factory farm, those horns become a problem. You know, they start fighting each other, just like the pig's bec um, tail becomes a problem in factory condition, and the beak of the chicken becomes a problem. So they de-beak, they burn the newborn chicken's beak. So they won't f 
wives fight each other, they detail the pigs. So they, will, they create conditions of violence and then do more violence to solve the problem, which can't be solved. Anyway, gene editing, some scientists in California said we will now gene edit a bull, uh, we'll get gene edit animals to be hornless for the meat industry to have more, bigger factory farms. But from somewhere in these gene edited animals, there was huge bacterial infection. And you cannot sell bacteria infected meat. So I remember this debate because they tried to get permission to sell it as b for beef and they were not allowed. So the imprecision is so known and yet the desperation is so huge. Because why is gene editing being pushed? Gene editing is being pushed because not only can they not work with the old GMOs anymore, they're trying very hard to pretend their nature. They're trying to pass it as a natural technology so that they can deregulate for biosafety and get out of labeling. So once they get gene editing through as natural, it will not require safety. So there'll be all this stuff happening in your food and you won't know it. And you won't be able to make the choice that I don't want to eat this stuff because it will have a label natural. Okay. So we are at a very dishonest moment, extremely dishonest moment in terms of our food. And this, because movements have been so successful, because the agro-organic movement has been so successful, because the biodynamic movement has been so successful, this is why the aggression to introduce fake technologies and force it on society has become the single most ag biggest agenda for the industry. And when I say industry, I mean both the financial part of it and the biotech part of it the part that wants to control the seed and now to control the food. So synthetic fertilizers began with synthetic, you know, began the introduction of synthetic elements, artificial elements into the food system. Then you had, instead of, of breeding of whole organisms with whole organisms, you now had genetic engineering to really not have the, the clearance of the organism to accept modification. It was a forcing of the organism. And in the process, you actually created fake seed. Why do I call it fake seed? Because the nature of seed is to arise. The word in India for seed is bija. Ja is life, bija is that which arises on its own forever and ever and ever. Because the seed doesn't ever get exhausted. But the, idea of creating terminator seed, non-renewable seeds, patented seeds, is trying to stop the urge of life from renewal. And it's worse than that, because not only is it trying to control the seed, it's then trying to criminalize the farmers who save seed and exchange seed. And this is the reason I save seeds. This is the reason I started Navdanya. This is the reason I do the work I do. We've created 150 community seed banks in India to reclaim seed as a commons. We've written laws that say seeds and animals and plants are not inventions. So in India, it's not patentable. And we have laws on farmers' rights, that farmers are the first breeders and their rights cannot be alienated. And I do hope some of you will find your way to Navdanya. I, I met some of people who have already been and I know the, uh, the young people who are going through the course come and visit. This this finding ways to extract, to make profit and turn renewability of life into non-renewability, to turn the abundance of life into scarcity is what the fake food is all about. So the fake food begins with, you know, the high fructose corn syrup made from GMO corn and you never hear of the harm it's doing. And because it's addictive, it's it, in, the America, in America, it's put in baby food, it's put in sausages, it's put in everything because it creates the urge 
to eat more. But now babies and children are getting cirrhosis of the liver because this molecule goes and hits straight away. The, because food is the currency of life, it is the communication between the soil and the plants. I want to just share with you my, my understanding of this, that if, as food is currency, then eating is a conversation. And there's actual research being done by brilliant scientists who show the difference between eating fresh organic food and the conversation that goes on between the cells in your gut and the food. And when they put chemical food, the discordance that goes on. And through that communication is the disease. So I've written, eating is a conversation between the soil, the plants, the cells in our gut, the cells in our food, and between our gut and our brain. Eating is an intelligent act at the deepest cellular and microbial level. The cellular communication is the basis of health and well-being. It is also the root of disease. Poisoned food creates disease. We might be ignorant about the links between food and health, but our cells are more intelligent. Our body is more intelligent than the reductionist mechanical mind contemporary humans have developed, where we think of food as fuel and our body as a machine. You know, when I go visit schools, the first question I ask children is, what is food? And because they're learning from textbooks, not from their grandmothers, they get up and say, our food is the fuel that runs the bo our bodies, which is a machine. So we have so degraded food and so degraded our bodies to not know anymore what food is. And it's in that confusion that the folk food system is coming in. High fructose corn syrup was the first. Then you might have seen suddenly the impossible burger, the burger without meat. And the person who founded it, Pat Brown, his name is, said, I found the most ecological alternative. What does he use? GMO soya, which has killed the monarch butterfly. The glyphosate is causing disease, and he calls it an ecological alternative. And the Impossible Burger shows you the future to which, which they are going, because they are looking at, actually, um, patenting food now, elements of food. Because everything, if everything you add is synthetic, there's a patent for it, 14 patents on that Impossible Burger. You're really eating a patent monopoly and GMO soya. But it doesn't stop there. It goes further. Because as long as there's an alternative, why would people go for rubbish like this? So you have to create a narrative, just like the narrative that started to make people feel first that organic is backward. You know, the advertisements in Europe by the industry were, it's dirty to use organic manure. You know, it's black, it's dirty. And then they'd bring ads to say, urea is white, it's so clean. And that's what changed the mindset. And there's an attempt to change our mindset about food and not just accept fake food, but accept it as the only solution to climate change. Now, this is where it goes crazy. Because it is, you know, it is true, I've written a book called Soil Not Oil. 50% of all greenhouse gas emissions in the world come from a globalized and industrialized food system. Emissions in the production, emissions in the food miles, emissions through destroying the forest for soya in the Amazon, palm oil in Indonesia, comes from packaging, processing, all of this is hugely energy intensive, that's 50%. Now, will more industrialization, more long distance transport, more energy use solve this problem or make it worse? It'll make it worse. But with it, a pseudoscience is being created. And that pseudoscience is animals are to blame. Animals are causing climate change. They're not. Because animals as part of the biosphere 
Of course, they have these short cycles of emitting a little bit of methane, but that methane comes back to the carbon cycle. And in 10 years' time, there's no methane. Otherwise, you know, in India, farmers used to have 20 to 30 head of cattle in each family. In, in the, the plains of America, the bison used to roam. You have the reindeer. Now, if animals were constantly emitting methane and it was building up, we'd have a very stinking planet. Like a waste dump, you know, it has a stink. Or when you go past these factory farms in America, they call them CAFOs, the Concentrated Animal Farm Operation. You just go past them, there's such a stink. That stink is methane. But our free-range animals are not stinking. There's a little bit, but you can see not just the bad science because the biogenic methane, it doesn't build up. But you just suddenly out of the blue, you know, animals are the problem, kill them. Ireland is talking about killing a million sheep. New Zealand is taxing all the animals for their burps. And next to you in Netherlands, they have this huge attack on farmers. And they're using the same excuse. And they want one third of the farms wiped out. No. The solution is make, one, make all the farms organic and biodynamic. You'll get rid of the nitrogen problem. Because the nitrogen problem is an industrial agriculture problem. The ecological solutions solve those problems. You know, on our farm, even, even the scientists who did the study for us, on our farm in, um, I think we did a 20 year study on the valley, and they couldn't believe it, you know? Because everyone thinks you put an input, then you have that object. So you put nitrogen fertilizer, you'll have nitrogen. In chemical soils, the nitrogen has depleted 22%. In organic soils, we're not applying any external input. The soil system is creating nitrogen up by 100%. So I think it's time to get rid of this input-output thinking. Because living systems create what the systems need and what the systems related to them need. The mycorrhizal fungi creates through its process what the plant needs. Our gut processes, you know, through 100 trillion microbes, and you know, Natasha's here, and she'll be having the course on, um, on food and brain. But when Roundup started, and you know, all these chronic diseases started, neuro neurological disorders started, and the graphs were showing it's going that way. And every time I'd show those graphs, the Monsanto lobbyists would attack. Correlation is not causation. So, but you know, a good scientist says, oh, if there's a correlation here, let me look for the, what the causation is. You don't escape from seeking causation. So there's an MIT scientist that I've come to know, and I said, okay, but let's begin with autism. What are, the, what are the consequences of glyphosate? We know all that. What are the symptoms of autism, and how are the two related? And she did this. And uh, Stephanie Seraf is her name, and she's uh, done a book on glyphosate. But Monsanto always used to say that glyphosate is totally safe for us because our cells don't have the shikimate pathway. And everyone said, yeah, so it can't do any impact. But I know other scientists like Professor Huber and all who pointed out, he says, the bacteria in the soil have a shikimate pathway. The bacteria in our gut have a shikimate pathway. And this disruption disruption by glyphosate is having huge increases. And, and your work, Natasha, is, is showing how much food is related to that. So the bacteria in our gut produce three aromatic amino acids, tryptophan, tyrosine, and phenylalamine through the shikimate pathway. Since our cells don't have the pathway, we have to have these bacteria in order to be able to process all this. These essential amino acids are precursors to the neurotransmitters, dopamine, serotonin, melatonin, and adrenal, as well as thyroid hormone, folate, and vitamin E. 
the killing of gut bacteria leads to deficiencies in this important biological molecules and impairs our neurological functions. Now, if your entire fake food will be using more GMOs, more Roundup, more synthetic chemicals added to pretend, you know, like in this impossible burger, they actually talk, they made a fake blood called heme to make it look like meat. And I can't understand. I said, you don't want to eat meat, don't eat meat. There are lots of vegetables. But why do you want to not eat meat, attack everyone, kill every cow, and then say, I want blood? It doesn't hang together for me. For the industry, I can understand. They'll tell any lie. DDT is good for you is how they sell DDT. But for the people who are getting convinced by fake food and the fake narrative and the fake science and the fake economics, that's what puzzles me. And it puzzles me particularly because those who think, really think they're solving the climate problem are running down this false line fastest. Fake food as a climate solution is a fake solution. Because it's avoiding the real path we must follow, deeper integration between animals, plants, and trees, which is what integrated farming is about. More biodiversity, if the planet could cool itself through the biosphere, then our farming must mimic that process to intensify photosynthesis, to intensify biodiversity. And our work has shown that the more you intensify biodiversity, the more you recycle the carbon and nitrogen, the more the soil becomes healthy, you produce more nutrition per acre. We don't measure yield per acre, but what's the point of measuring nutritionally empty commodities? Food is about eating. Food is about nourishment. And if it's nutritionally empty food, you're going to get all kinds of sicknesses and disease. Because we do the soil work and we had, you know, in, in the chemical soils, the the zinc had gone down 34%, and in the organic soils, it had gone up 24%. So this public health specialist had come and was visiting us in, um, in Navdanya, and she saw this data, and she says, now I understand why our young people are depressed, because she does brain chemistry. And she found that half of Australia's teenagers were depressed, all of them had zinc deficiency. But if, if there's no zinc in your soil and no zinc on your food, you will have zinc deficiency. You will have magnesium deficiency and have an attention deficit. Yeah? But the chemical world just wants another chemical solution for each of these things. So there's a British meta study covering more than 400 studies that has found that organic foods can have up to 60% more beneficial nutrition than chemical food. And the, the deficiency now, you know, it's being, it's interesting, you know, a paper comes out in a nutrition journal or in a toxicology journal. For two days, it's there, measuring the nutritional emptiness of industrial food and how, how much more phytochemicals, how much more nutrients the real food has. And then you cannot Google that article. Just as much as when the whole issue of immunity came up. Now, everyone you knows that organisms are healthy when they have immunity, any organism. If a plant is organically fed, it is more resilient and will not be impacted by pests. There'd be the same pests in the field. But the chemically grown field will have attack of pests and the organically grown field will not have an attack of pests. That's what Howard saw when he says lots of insects and no pests. So we, we're growing more and more nutritionally empty co commodities at higher and higher cost. And then we're turning it in magically into cheap food. How can a high cost production system lead to cheap food? Because the structures of subsidies the structures of trade, the structures of 400 billion is the agriculture subsidy that makes industrial food 
cheap enough to dump on third world countries. So they become dependent. Self-sufficient countries who were growing their own food are now importing. And it takes one little instability in the war, one collapse in supply chains for people to have no food. So real food, real farming, for me, is the biggest climate solution. And, and we've done this work. When you have a climate disaster, what do you want? You want seeds that are resilient, and we've saved the seeds that are resilient, climate tolerant, uh, salt tolerant, flood tolerant, drought tolerant seeds. And they're able to survive and come back after a cyclone, after a drought. You want good resilience in the soil. Where does the resilience of the soil come from? in a time where climate change is leading to more floods and more droughts. You need better holding of water. If your soil can, soil can hold more water, the flood is not severe. The flood is worst in areas where the soil has been totally panned. And if there's a drought, you want moisture in your soil. 1% organic matter holds 160%, say 160,000 liters of water in a hectare. The soil is a water reservoir. Healthy living soils are a water reservoir. Healthy living soils are not just the resilience and adaption to climate change, but they are the mitigation. And now so many studies are being done. On an average, basically they're showing that if we stop fossil fuel use, in 10 years we can draw down the excess carbon dioxide through intensifying the biosphere's capacity to do photosynthesis. And the more the fungal population, the more the photosynthesis increases. So we're in a very exciting moment where the real science is backing real food and real farming, making connections between the soil and our gut, making connections between the biodiversity outside and the biodiversity within us, not just the biodiversity in our gut microbiome, but increasingly what's really inspiring me is the shift that is taking place from what I have called the monoculture of the mind. The monoculture of the mind thinks of only one value. Soya bean is available, just grow soya. Finish off the prairies, just grow GM soya. BT cotton, just make everything BT cotton. Eucalyptus, just plant eucalyptus plantations. And this monoculture of the mind is what has destroyed biodiversity. But that's not how minds are. Minds, because they are the relational world that's in constant co-creation, this biodiverse world has a biodiverse mind. And we have biodiverse minds. The ability to see in the whole as well as analyze in the small. It's, that's what good science is about. To see the system and then look at the part. But the illusion is when you only look at the part and deny the whole. That's where the destruction starts to happen. And that destruction is, of course, destroying the earth. But worse, it is, you know, I, I often feel that the vicious way in which the poison wakers who are killing life on earth attack those who are protecting life on earth is like contemporary witch hunts. You know, 1493 was the papal bull that justified Columbus's, you know, going and take, say, take over the territories on our behalf. But I always joke and say, you know, at that time at least there was a god, and then there was a pope, and then the, below the pope were the kings and queens, and then the queen, kings and queens found adventurers like Columbus. What do we have now? The corporations are the creators, they play god, they are the government, they've hijacked our governments. They are kings and queens, they run everything. And they are the merchant adventurers and the pirates of our time. Just more sophisticated, but it's the same old thing. And, and the fact that, you know, the best practices of organic, of biodynamic, and as, you know, I, I will be going to Gatanium for the big celebrations in February. I think I have to speak on February 1st. Because everywhere the biodynamic movement is being attacked. 
in France, in Italy. Cases are being filed. When you say your food is healthier, you are misleading the public. You know, so we are living in very Orwellian times. Lies are truth and truth are lies. Health is sickness and sickness is health. So in this moment, r the real becomes an awakening. But of course the real can be terribly troublesome in the mechanistic reductionist view because in a mechanistic view we are separate from nature. Everything is a machine, everything is an object. And in that dead world, you can't create a knowing, except through violence. That's why Bacon suggested violence, torture of nature. But in a living world, knowledge is interaction and dialogue, like food is a conversation. Knowing is a conversation between self-organized intelligent beings. And at this time, as so many crises are converging, which actually have the same roots. The, the same problem, the same fossil fuel world creates climate change. The same fossil fuel chemicals cause extinction of species because if insecticides are sprayed to kill insects, insects will disappear. If herbicides are designed to kill, kill plants, the biodiversity of your plants will disappear. So, the real is the real lived relationships in a living world. Then the epistemological gap doesn't happen. If we are separate and the object is inert and you're the knowing person, you'll always keep thinking, how do you know, how do you know, how do you know? And then objective knowledge, they call it, becomes totally subjective knowledge of projecting onto the world your illusions. But in the real world, life itself is the teacher. In the real world, intelligence is distributed. And there's such amazing work being done on intelligence of bacteria, intelligence of plants, intelligence of animals, intelligence of soil organism. The mycorrhizal fungi is an intelligent organism that's making choices at every moment. What mineral to take up, what toxics to reject. And in this, world of vibrant life, rich diversity, and deep intelligence. Living the real, defending, uh, practicing real farming, eating real food, in my view, becomes the revolutionary act for life, freedom, and health. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Shiva. Um, we have about just under half an hour for questions. Um, Tessa and I will be running around with a microphone, um, but perhaps we can also ask for your support in getting it to the right people. Um, so if you can just, if you have a question to raise your hand up high and we'll try and get the mic to you. Yes. Okay, thank you. It's really interesting. So you're talking about the Green Revolution, uh, and I wonder what is the biggest difference between the Green Revolution in the 1960s uh, with Norman Bullock in the front line, and now the Green Revolution in the African region with Bill Gates in the front line. What would you say is the biggest difference between these two? Well, for one, there's a continuity, because Borlaug was not in the front line. It was the Rockefeller Foundation and the US Department, uh, USAID and the World Bank. He was the scientist who was hired to change the plants to take more chemicals. You know, as I put in my book, The Green Revolution, he'd 
He say, if I was a parliamentarian on in, uh, in India, I would get up every minute and shout, fertilizers, give me more fertilizers. And Mr. Bill Gates is saying exactly the same right now for Africa. He said, I love fertilizers. At a time when everyone knows the high cost of synthetic fertilizers. Uh, I think the only difference is India's a large subcontinent, but the World Bank and Rockefeller zoomed in on Punjab, which was the most fertile and prosperous area. In the case of Africa, they're wanting to cover all of Africa because they have to do two things. First is shift from ecological farming to fertilizer-based, synthetic fertilizer. And second, the seed system, you know, in India we had a very highly organized seed system, including government institutions, including private industry. But Africa, most of the seed system is farmer seed system. So in order to capture that, they have to commercialize the seed. So right now they are not pushing GMO seeds. They're pushing commercialization of the seed system and making Local seed illegal. I've been to Africa two or three times because law after law is brought. I think in Ghana they've just tried it in, uh, in another South African country, making farmers' seed saving illegal. And you know, this is the reason I started Navdani. I said, no, saving seed is our highest duty. How can our duty be converted into a crime? I will not accept that. So. You know, and this, they tried it in Europe. I think it was 2015, where they brought a law called, they brought draft law called plant propagation law. And my friends in the European Parliament started to ask me, say, this, this law that's come, we, we can't understand what it's about, we don't know if it's about seed, so they sent me the text. So I wrote back to them immediately, I said, it is a seed law. It's a law to prohibit. In, Seeds that are not registered, but early, you know, your systems are national systems. Sweden decides what's in the register. Italy decides what's in the register. But this new law would have required a Greek farmer on a small island or someone in the Tuscan hills who's growing ancient wheat to come to Brussels to take permission for their planting. So I wrote 1,200 corrections, sent it back to the parliament, and, uh, and then did a pilgrimage. We did a seed pilgrimage, very powerful pilgrimage. Start, you know, in the southern parts, the Mediterranean parts which are rich, started from Greece, Italy to France. And, and that, that law is in deep freeze right now. What should be in deep freeze is the Svalbard ice, which is where Mr. Gates has put the seeds. But uh, that's melting. Yeah. <laughs> People used to, but the films have been made on, you know, Navdanya's philosophy of living seed, conserving it by growing it out, and the Svalbard, of fr freezing it. And I said there are two reasons why it won't work. Because we work with seed, and we know what it takes to take this much seed, to multiply it enough to give it to 10 farmers. And these little packages that are in the doomsday mall cannot be multiplied fast enough, if there is a disaster. But I said, anyway, those ice, that ice is melting with climate change. Yeah? So how far will they be able to save those seeds? But the reason, these seeds are not valuable for multiplying. They are valuable for digital mapping. So there's gene editing with the manipulation of the plant, but there's digital mapping, which is Mr. Gates' attempt to own the seed through digital maps. So these little packages have in it, this corn is drought tolerant, it matures in two months, and it has this flavor. Well, he just had to do a general map, and he said, I created it. And this is how most new patterns are being taken, are through digital mapping. Thank you. Question over here. Thank you so much. Um, my question is, um, have you received any resistance on a personal level um, as a consequence of you talking about these topics? And how do you handle them when it's 
like a large corporation standing against your message or something? Yeah, so the first time I, I received conflicts, uh, received threats, was when I was doing a mining study for the government. And this was in my valley, so I came back to study. And I get called from the miners saying, if you go back to the field, you'll find your eight-year-old dad and your eight-month child dead. So I came and talked to my dad. I said, you know, this is what they're saying. And it's in the film that was screened that, you know, and my dad said, doing your duty, duty, following your conscience is your highest role. You must continue. And there are higher forces that protect us. I mean, that's something he always said to me. There are higher forces that protect us. Then I filed a case against Monsanto when they brought the GMO cotton illegally. And I got massive threats. And, you know, they kept, you know, one, min one minute the call would come from Paris, another minute it would come from, you know, all the consequences I would face. So what did I do? I called my friends and said, just photocopy this case. And if I don't turn up in the court, you deal with the lawyers. So multiply, multiply. <laughs> the seed teaches us that the best defense is multiply. I have a, oh, okay, thank you <laughs> so much. I, I have a question about soils that have been treated with glyphosate. Is it, how long does it take for it to be living again? Well, you know, the soil is so powerful, as our bodies are, you know? Any living system organizes itself in life and it organizes its healing. Engineered systems collapse and break down. Cars break down, computers break down. A plant doesn't break down. It heals itself. The soil doesn't break down. It heals itself. So I can tell you from two examples. When the tsunami hit, I went in to help the Tamil Nadu farmers. And the government had said, for five years, we won't be able to grow food because there's too much salt on the land. And too, too, you know, the water that came from that ocean was black. There's so much toxics in the ocean. So this toxic layer in the salt, they said, won't be able to salt. So we had saved the salt tolerant seeds in our seed bank in Orissa, which has 1,200 kinds of seed varieties. And we said, we'll bring it. The bureaucracy, of course, tried to stop the farmer's trucks. You know? um, but eventually, you know, we got there, we distributed. And of course, we helped the farmers with organic training very fast. We gave the seeds and did organic. Within a season, you know, the agriculture bounced back, but within the season, the toxics had been removed. And I saw this also in Fukushima. I visited Fukushima, and then I organized in India a conference learning from disasters, because we usually panic with disasters. I said, what is it that we learn? It was amazing, you know, whether it was the Indian tsunami or the Indian Orissa cyclone or the disaster in Japan. What everyone ended up saying was, you, you learn that A, we are part of nature and nature is more powerful. But the Fukushima research showed scientists worked with organic farmers. Even the radiation was removed from the soil. Or the fungi. So we, I think, you know, in, in the course, there was some uh, question about trust. I think we made to distrust life. And so we always feel, in, we, we feel doubt, you know, we hesitate. And life's been around, <laughs> you know, and we need to start trusting life and aligning with the processes. And that to me is the ecological life.
Hi, hi. Thank you for your um, everything. <laughs> I just wonder what's your thoughts on uh, how uh, how biodynamic farming is supplied in 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 the global south or yes, in India, uh, which is developed by German in Germany with the German plants or plants that are in that occur in Europe. And how do you, yeah, how do you translate it, or what's your thought around using it in this global south? Well, actually, from what I know, Steiner came to India and got inspired, including learning how to make homeopathic solutions in the horns of cows. Yeah? So, of course... So, the, the whole tradition, the whole biodynamic farming is based on old traditions from India. Would you say no, that? elements of it, because oh. I think any creative mind takes an insight and then puts it to a, a deeper learning. Of course, if he's, in, if he's in Germany and Switzerland, he'll use local plants. But that doesn't mean there will not be plants in different regions. But what's the, like if taking the ideas from traditional farming in India, for example, uh, what do you think that has had another effect on maybe eliminating traditional methods and farming methods? No, that mm. did not. What had the impact of eliminating methods was the Green Revolution. The Green Revolution said all your indigenous practices are wrong. It's not, it's not the spreading of knowledge. You know, that's why I love the seed and I love knowledge. If I have seed and I share it with you, I can still grow my seed and you can grow yours. It's the intellectual property that creates poverty, making it illegal for us to exchange and for us to save seeds. That's where the seed famine start. Knowledge is the same. If I share knowledge, I don't have less of it. There's more of it in the world. But piracy is different, yeah? If Steiner came to India and then came and said, totally my invention and I have intellectual property on it. And then prohibited the Indians who were using those same techniques in an earlier way to prevent them, that would be criminal. And that's what the seed industry is doing. That's what the chemical industry is doing. They steal our seeds, they steal our knowledge. That's what I call biopiracy. And then they use intellectual property. They take intellectual property by stealing and then say, I've invented it. And a patent prevents anyone else from making, using, developing the patented, whatever is patented. So they can steal our neem and come back and say, you can't use neem. That's why I fought the neem piracy. 11 years, 11 years we fought the US government and WR race and defeated them. Um, I, think, I think we have time for two questions. There's one here and this lady here was next. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> I have a question. Have you ever talked to Mr. Gates? Yes, and I've debated him many times. Okay. And also, my question is, how do you, how do you debate with people that are capitalistic or monoculture? That's or not the issue. The problem is you can't debate with a dumb man. Hello, yeah, now it works. Thank you so much. I'm deeply touched by everything you've said and by the wisdom you share. Uh, I just want to ask, being you know, in a wealthy country, educated, being probably active 
we in the public here, uh, we in the, the audience, what would you advise us to do? I don't advise, but I share. And what if I was here in Sweden today, with all the qualities that you have said, the first thing I would do is build a strong movement of real farmers, real food. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shiva. It's always so good to listen to you. Sitting in this fantastic hall, uh, more or less handmade around you, uh, I have a question. Uh, you are talking about sharing. Uh, so, how do you think a couple of elements of how could the biodynamic farming share some specific issues for the future in a common revolution for real farming and real food? Some few examples from you. Thank you. Well, you know, I think the reason there's such an attack on, on the biodynamic movement is because the biodynamic movement takes your consciousness to a higher level and you make your decisions about farming and your food in a much more thoughtful way and much more informed way. The second is the biodynamic results are so huge. That too. I think the entire mechanistic path is to focus on superficial quantity, yield of nutritionally empty commodities. The power of biodynamic is to focus on the potential and quality. And that's the shift we need. That's the big movement from obsession with quantity to realizing the quality and uh, a shift from objects and stuff and essentialism and inertness and, you know, staticness to a world of flow, of potential, of interaction and oneness. Hello, yeah, there we go. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Vanana Shiva, for your time and for sharing all of your wisdom with us. Uh, I saw that there were more questions, but unfortunately we're out of time for today. Um, yeah, and I just wanted to offer a small token of our gratitude. Uh, it's from the land here, um, because food is the currency of life, and this is uh, water from the birch trees to oh. keep you hydrated on your travel. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much.